in the Lord? Yes, it is. <laughs> uh, so for those of you who are still fellowshipping inside the sanctuary, please take your fellowship to the hallway or coffee shop. And uh, yeah, the rest of us, let's go before the Lord in worship and prayer. Yes, let's do this thing. All right, Lord, we just want to lift your name on high. Because, God, you are worthy of our prayers. You are worthy of our worship. And, Lord, I just thank you so much uh, just for bringing Kenneth here today. And, uh, Lord, just for the wonderful message that he gave us. First service, Lord, I just ask that your spirit would be upon him for second service as well. And, uh, Lord, that we would just completely benefit from all of the good things that you have for us today. Jesus, we love you so much, and we want to offer you this time in your holy and precious name, in the name of Jesus. Amen. And if you want to stand and worship, we invite you to do that. If you want to sit and worship, you can do that too.
Yes, Jesus, it is your love that draws us closer to you. And Lord, oh my gosh, it is just so good to be called your child. And I pray, God, as, as we continue to worship you, that you would overwhelm us right now with the power of your spirit. And God, you would just be blessed. so much just for the peace that we feel when you are present and God I just pray that as we just lift our voices up to you God that you would just draw us closer to you Lord we believe in who you are we trust in your promises your word is truth God we just want to know you more Just now, your blood. 
this time of worshiping you, Lord, and may you just carry on through us, God, in us, just this time of worshiping you through the study of your word, through fellowship with our brothers and sisters, and God, we just again want to give you all glory and honor because you are worthy. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen. If you could turn to your next door neighbor there next to you. Turn to someone you don't know either. Look for unfamiliar face and say, hey. There's no
love to hear from you. Uh, don't leave without being noticed. Uh, talk to one of the ushers or fill out one of those cards in the seats behind you. After service, during worship, we'll have guys standing under these prayer signs. I encourage you to take advantage of that. The only bad prayer is one that goes unprayed. Um, if you need a Bible, we have ushers up here in front. Please just raise your hand, uh, and they'll be glad to bring you one. If you, need, uh, if you don't have one, feel free to keep them. Um, and if you guys will grab your bulletins and open to the uh, first and second page, we'll go through this real quick. Uh, tomorrow and every Monday, we've got the Not Ashamed Outreach Group. Uh, we kind of meet to both equip and then uh, go out in the street and share the gospel with people who need it around here. I encourage you to come out for that. There's more info on the webpage. Uh, Wednesday nights, uh, awesome study midweek. We are in the Pentateuch. Pastor Rod always finds a way to tie it into just hanging out with Jesus. So come out and get fed. If not, those messages are online. Uh, we'll review any time. Uh, this will probably be the last Sunday to sign up for the Back to Basics Women's Retreat, which we still have room. If you guys haven't signed up yet, you can go out to that info booth uh, and do that. Cost is going to be 135 uh, Next Saturday, we've got the uh, Juvenile Detention Outreach, which is always a really awesome time. These kids are hungry. They're scared. They want to hear about Jesus. Uh, you can contact Charlton West for, for more info on that. Um, if you want to sign up to serve, it's really easy. Just head online. Uh, the video ministry children's ministry always needs more servants and then uh, we need we could use some more folks in the bookstore uh, after service from two to five on sundays at the school of ministry i encourage you to come check that out if you want to join it's not too late uh dr santiago does a great job uh teaching uh and if you want to give we have agape boxes around the uh the campus here and then we'll be passing the plate during uh during worship service afterward um pastor rod is out of town today so we got mr ken duje from uh cusco peru to tell us all about the awesome stuff God's doing down there. Thanks, guys. And one of these days, I will figure out this microphone. <laughs> Things. So, hi. Good morning. Um, you know, like I was, I was sharing with first service. I'm, I'm quite a bit different than Pastor Rod. Um, and. You know, a lot of times you could probably just stop at the I'm quite a bit different part and leave out the from anything, really. But so I was thinking, you know, when, when, when Rod asked me if I, would, if I would teach while I was here, I was like, yeah, that's awesome. And you know, there's this thing that plays Bobby. through my head all the time Girl. that um, here we go everybody should have so intro music, I I right? So, so here's the here's the thing. Like at this point, the, the lights go dim, and I'm I'm back back there. The lights the lights are off. There's disco balls, and then there's a there's a spotlight, and, there, and then there's a ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Kenneth Duje, and then I'm you know oh, you know it's kind of like an MMA fight, right? Coming out here, and I'm like yeah. So yeah, you can turn it off. Now. So my intro music, nothing by Lecrae. Um, but you know, there's a reason for that, and, and so like as I'm as I'm thinking about, okay, I'm going to be teaching at at my home church, you know, and 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 here I am again after after four and a half years of of being gone, and 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 I'm here, and and I'm back in the United States, and I I listen to what goes on, you know, from time to time and everything else, and there's a lot of preachers out there that are talking about nothing, right? Nothing, like they don't open their Bible. They want to smile at you. They want you to feel good. They want you to leave. They want you to drop your money in the box. They don't want to hurt your feelings. I want to do all of those things. <laughs> I want to hurt your feelings. I want you to feel something today. I want you to feel a connection with Jesus. And I don't want to talk about nothing. I want to talk about what the Word of God has for us. You know, so if you have a Bible, go ahead and open up your Bible to Matthew chapter 18. And I know that um, a lot of you have been around for a while, and you're like, Matthew 18, that's that whole resolving conflict or that kind of nonsense, right? Right. So one of the things that, that I want to share with you, I, if you focus your attention on the, on the board for just a second, just a little slideshow of what's going on down in, in Cusco. For those of you that don't know, Cusco is, is um, in the middle of the Andes Mountains. It is 
360 miles away from Lima. It is at an altitude of 11,200 feet above sea level, and it is very lost. Um, we're involved in a couple of different ministries out there. If you're looking right now, that's, uh, that's an orphanage called Oswawasi. We go out there and minister to those kids and take groups and stuff out there as well and have, have some good times with them because that this is, it's, a, it's an orphanage that was started by an ex-police officer that is almost completely funded by his retirement fund. And uh, about midway through the month, every month, they run out of money. So we want to connect them with as many people as we possibly can so that hopefully somebody grabs a hold of the idea that, hey, I can help these kids out. You know, so that's, that's also Wasi. And then, you know, here on these pictures, this is at a, a Bible club that we do every Saturday for the kids in the neighborhood. This is a park about a block away from our church building. Um, we go out there every Saturday, give them, give them a Bible study, give them crafts to do. This is our church right here. Uh, it is a room in a building right there. used to be a poyeria or a, a chicken and fries restaurant. We put some little bit of work into it uh, for a while and then opened it up for Bible study in February of last year and have been working and working and working and we got about seven people that come to church on a regular basis and um, we get a lot of visitors through the door, and some stick around, some do not. But, you know, what we're doing is, is, if nothing else, we're planting the seeds, and people are going out and trying to find a place that will teach them the Word of God. And, you know, that's our goal. We also do uh, some work with the university students, teaching them English, helping them work on their English, and those kinds of things. Again, Bible club every Saturday with the kids. And then it's going to get there eventually. But my daughter, my daughter Hannah, my oldest, um, worked with one of the groups that came down last year and really got a heart for a particular clinic in town called San Juan de Dios. And at Clinica San Juan de Dios, there are a bunch of kids that have cerebral palsy or some other disability that keeps them strapped into a wheelchair. Um, and my daughter fell in love with those kids, decided that her ministry would be to go and visit these kids a couple days a week, um, just play with them, hang out with them, talk to them, be their friend. Uh, a lot of these kids are abandoned by their parents there at the hospital, and so they live at the hospital. The hospital staff takes care of them, and they don't have family, friends, or anything else. And Hannah decided that that would be her thing. And uh, she and Letty go and visit that place two times a week and, and just really pour their hearts and souls into it, and it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And the thing that's, that's the greatest about it is that she decided to make that her own. We didn't tell her, you have to do this. You know, she grabbed a hold of a vision to, to just be somebody's friend. And you know, so you can, you can stop that now. One of the things that's been really impressed upon me over the last four years being in Peru is relationships. Because... You know, I grew up here in, in Texas. I grew up in, in, in Houston and then came down to, to Corpus Christi after going all over the place for a while and came to, came to Corpus. So I'm, I'm American, you know. And when I walk into a place of business, I walk into to a place of business and I lay my business out on the table, you know. I walk in and say, this is what I want. This is what I want you to do. Everything else, I might say hi. I might say, how you doing? But I don't wait for an answer. You know, who else is like that? Just me? All right. Well. So, <laughs> wow. Um, but one of the things that's, that's crazy about the, the culture that, that we live in now is it's all about relationships. You walk into a place of business, you will have a conversation for an hour, hour and a half before you get down to business. You'll know all about their kids. You'll know all about their wife, their, their family, their, where they live, how long they've been in Cusco, uh, where they went to school, what they studied when they were in school, why they're working where they are now, everything. You'll find all that out before you can even say, yeah, I just want a hamburger. <laughs> you know? Um, so this is, this is very different than the way that I grew up. Very different than the way that I imagined things. Very different than, 
anything that I had experienced before. And so one of the things that has been really impressed upon me over the last, um, the last year especially, but over the course of the last four years, is how important relationships are. You know, we have our relationships with our family, with our friends, and those kinds of things, and those are great. But, you know, one of the things that, that God did for us when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, was he gave us the ministry of reconciliation. You know, and that ministry of reconciliation goes across every relationship that we have. You know, so if I can invite you into my mind for just a second, which you might not want to come, but please join me. I don't like fake stuff. See that? What is it? It's a fake bell pepper. That ain't a real bell pepper. Hate it. You know what that is? That's a fake cucumber. You know what that is? I don't know if that's a tomato or if that's a, a red bell pepper. Anyway, it's fake. I don't like it. I don't like fake stuff. I don't like decaf coffee. Decaf coffee is like fake coffee. <laughs> you know, it's, it's fake. And, and, and I don't like fake stuff. So I don't want us to be fake here today. I want to be real. Who's all for being real at church? Excellent. I love you. You know, y'all are a much better looking crowd than first service as well. <laughs> um, so I don't, I don't want to be fake. I want to be real with us today. And, and so as we... As we get into this, I, I just want to, you know, I'm, I'm going to be personal. And, you know, you may not like it. Sorry. We're talking about forgiveness. I'm going to ask you to forgive me right now for anything that, that I may say that, that causes you to not be comfortable anymore um, with the way that things are. Um, I'm also at that point in my life that I know I need to exercise, right? Everybody needs to exercise. And so I, so what do I do? Because I do this with everything. I do it with plane tickets. I do it with, you know, whatever. I, I did some research. So I've done my research, right? And I know what a healthy diet looks like. And I know what my diet looks like. And I've made a little bit of changes to have a, a slightly healthier diet. I also know that I live, like I said, at 11,200 feet above sea level. And I know that if I just walk up and down the stairs, just walk up and down the stairs for 20 minutes at a time, my heart rate will reach 156 beats per minute for 20 minutes. It, it won't be that high for 20 minutes, but by the time I end at 20 minutes, my heart rate will be 156 beats per minute. I know that during that time, my body, because of where we are and everything else, my body will burn between 1,200 and 1,300 calories in that time. I know that if I do that two times a day, five days a week, at the end of the week, I will lose between two and three pounds of fat. That simple. I did my research. I also know that I need to drink water, especially that high up. It's not humid, anything else. I need to drink water. I don't need to drink Gatorade. I don't need Sport Aid. I don't need tea. I don't need coffee. I don't, well... Okay, I don't need coffee. I want coffee. Um, but I don't need sodas. I don't need those kinds of things. I need water, and I need about a gallon of water because of where I live and because of the lack of water in the, in the air in order to maintain healthy insides. Okay? I've done my research. I know all of that stuff. But the question then becomes, have I embraced that knowledge? <laughs> Thanks. Um, <laughs> so that, I mean, that's the question. But then the question, too, is for us talking to a church. I'm assuming that all of us in here have at one point in time done our research. We know that Jesus Christ came to the earth about 2,000 years ago. We know that he was conceived of the Virgin Mary by the Holy Spirit. We know that he was born of the Virgin Mary. We know that he lived a sinless life. We know that he was there, that he was beaten, that he was ridiculed, that he was made fun of, that he was punched in the gut, all of those kinds of things, and that he ultimately died so that he could forgive me of my sins and you of yours. 
I know all of those things. I also know that three days after the, that death, he came back to life. He raised himself back to life, showing that death has no hold on him. And if I receive him as my Savior, death no longer has a hold on me. I know that. I did my research. But again, the question is, have I really embraced that? And what do I mean by embrace that? I mean, I mean take it in and make it part of who I am. Same thing with the exercise. If I don't exercise, if I don't embrace that lifestyle, I grow this way. You know, I'm, I'm done growing this way. I grow this way. And then I can't keep up with my kids. And then I can't do all the running around. And then I might go to an early grave. <laughs> I know, too, if I don't embrace what I know about Jesus Christ, when I pass on from this world, there ain't nothing good for me. And I know, too, that in order to embrace and really make what I know about Jesus Christ part of my life is I have to exercise that faith. I have to do something about it. And I know that when I do those things, whether it be exercise for my body or exercise for my spirit or, or putting, embracing those things that I know, I know that it will bring about change. I know it will bring about change. If I exercise like I told you, I shrink, you know? Things get tighter. If I exercise what I know about Jesus Christ... My faith grows. I see things happen. There's some change. And it's visible. And it's visible not only to me, but it's visible to everybody around me. And so, I want us to embrace all the research that we've done. We know all of these things. Now it's time to make it part of who we are. Okay? And so, in order to do that, I'm, I'm asking you to look at Matthew chapter 18... And, and you're probably going, well, th isn't this resolving conflict? Well, it is resolving conflict, and it's forgiving people. And, and we're going to talk about that because relationships are so important. Because Jesus came so that we might have a relationship with him. And if he thought that relationships were that important, I should think that relationships are that important. And I should do everything that I can to make sure that I reconcile as many of my earthly relationships as I possibly can to me, but also to God. And so we're going to look at this portion of Scripture, and, and we're going to talk about these kinds of things. So if you have your Bible, if you haven't opened there already, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 18, and we're going to look at verses 21 through 35. So if you're there, awesome. If you're not, get there. And uh, we'll start in, at verse 21. It says, Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times. And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you up to seven times, but up to seventy times seven. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him ten thousand talents. But he was not able to pay. His master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. The servant therefore fell down before him, saying, Master, have patience with me, and I will pay you all. Then the master of that servant was moved with compassion, released him, and forgave him the debt. But that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, who owed him a hundred denarii. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe! So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I'll, I'll pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till, it should, till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were very grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry. And delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due to him. So my heavenly father also will do to you if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. 
So it's a nice little story, right? Sweet, to the point, you know, Jesus just kind of laying things out for the, for the guys here. But, you know, the thing that's interesting and, and that I like about this in particular is because, you know, we, we look at Peter and Peter kind of gets a bad rap most of the time because people are like, oh, Peter's the one that says stupid stuff all the time. And you're like, well, yeah, but he's like me, you know, because I, I look at things and I, and I go, well, this is what happens, you know. So if we back up to verse 15 in this, in this chapter, it says, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. And if he hears you, you have gained your brother. And it seems at this point that Peter stopped listening to what Jesus was saying and just kind of grabbed a hold of that. And he was like, yeah, I need to impress Jesus because, you know, I, I need to let him know that I'm, I'm the smartest of these guys and... And the most spiritual, so I need to impress Jesus somehow. And, and so he missed all of this other stuff that's in the next couple of verses. And then in verse 21, he says, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? And Jesus was like, man, you were wrong. Not just seven times, he said, but I, but I tell you, up to 70 times, seven times. And he says this not to say that you have to forgive up to this amount of times, but what he's saying is, is hey, man, you know, as long as somebody messes up and, and offends you, does something against you, every single time, forgive him. Forgive him. Move on. You know, we live in a day and age where everything offends people. You know, if, if I breathe wrong in this direction, it offends these people over here. You know, if I don't breathe over here it offends these people over here you know if i if when i'm speaking i i talk and i focus and i stand on that side of the pulpit it offends these people over here you know and and it and it's just this this world of offense and and people want to hold on to that and, and grab a hold of it and go you know what no i'm not going to forgive you because you did that thing that one time to that guy right and I don't know what it is anymore, but it, it made me hate you. And, uh, and I'm like, well, you know, I probably did. But I never knew that it offended anybody. I was just living, you know. In the last year in Cusco, um, we, we went through the book of John. And then after we finished the book of John, we went through Jude. And we're currently in that kind of limbo stage between books. And, but... Something interesting happened at the, end of, at, at the end of the book of John, in John chapter 21. And, and if you haven't read it, I would encourage you to reread it again because it's, it's, really, it's really interesting and it's really different if you look at it in light of, of what's actually going on instead of looking for a big, gigantic lesson in the whole thing. But what happened was his disciples are hanging out, and this is John chapter 21. This is after Jesus' death. This is after Jesus' resurrection. This is after Jesus has shown himself twice to the disciples before he ascended into heaven. But it's in that 40-day period between his resurrection and the ascension that, that this is going on. And so we see the disciples hanging out, kind of feeling sorry for themselves because Jesus isn't right there with them anymore. You know, they spent the last three years of their lives dedicated to following this guy around, learning from him and everything else, and then he was... He was put to death, and, and they were crushed. You know, they were like, oh, man, no more Jesus. Then Jesus came back, and they're like, yeah, more Jesus. But then Jesus went away, and they're like, oh, dang it. And then Jesus came back and showed himself again, and they're like, all right, we're, we're back with Jesus. But then Jesus went away. And so he's, he's in this place where, where Jesus isn't with them anymore. He's not standing right there. He's not walking with them. He's not telling them, you should do this. You shouldn't do that. Those people need you. You love them. You, you cast out demons here. All of that's not happening. They're just there, and they're like, Jesus is gone, and, and I don't know what to do anymore because he told me what to do, and now he's, now he's gone, and, and what, am I, what am I supposed to do? No, Jesus. So... They're in this place, and they're, and they're whining and feeling sorry for themselves and everything else. And Peter's like, well, I'm going fishing. And, uh, and they're like, go for it, man. And so 
he goes, and, and so all of this stuff is happening, but really at the, at the heart of it, like, they're feeling lost. You know, the, the guy that's giving them directions, the, the, the guy that's walked with them hand in hand for these last three years, he's not there anymore. But it's interesting, if you, if you look at this, a couple, of, a couple chapters earlier, Jesus was hanging out with his disciples, and he breathed on them, and he said, receive the Holy Spirit. You know, and he doesn't tell us at, at that particular time, but we know as we study through the scriptures that as we receive Jesus Christ, we receive his Holy Spirit. He uses that as kind of an earnest down payment on our soul, right? He puts the Holy Spirit into us. However, that is not the empowering of the Holy Spirit to do the ministry. We don't see that happen until Acts on the day of Pentecost when they're all hanging out and then all of a sudden the fire's dancing all over their head and they're like, whoa, we can talk in weird languages. You know, that's when we see that they were actually empowered by the Holy Spirit to do the work of the ministry. And so as we receive Jesus Christ and we have that, that going on, you know, we're marked as his. The Holy Spirit lives inside of us, but he's not actively pushing us in, in this direction or that direction. We have to receive that a separate time. We have to look at that and go, God, I, I need your power. I need you in order to be able to do what I need to do, what you've asked me to do, what you've called me to do, which is ministry. I need the Holy Spirit in order to do the work of the ministry. But I have the Holy Spirit because I believe in Jesus. Well, he lives inside of you, but he hasn't kicked you in the pants to get the stuff done that you need to get done. So, it brings me personally to a place where I have to ask myself, well, where am I in this process? You know, do I, do I work all the time out of my own strength, out of my own flesh, out of my own everything, and try to get done everything on my own? Or am I actually trusting God to fill me with his spirit and to give me the words, the power, the, the energy, the everything to do the work that he's called me to? You know, have I received that Holy Spirit? And too often I think, no. No, I'm, I'm, I'm working. Look at me, I'm sweating. I'm sweating to get this stuff done. It's not being done through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's doing through, yeah, it's getting done through the power of Kenneth. You know, and that, and that sucks. <laughs> it's, it's no good, you know, because at the end of the day, it'll probably fall apart. But if it's put together by the Holy Spirit, it, it won't. It's going to be everything that he wants it to be. But I, I neglect to take the time to sit and wait on that empowering of the Holy Spirit. And I wonder sometimes if I'm doing what I think the Lord has called me to do, and he says something to me, would I even recognize his voice? Like, am I in that place where I would recognize that he's telling me, okay, do this, do that, do the other thing? Or have I gotten myself so busy with ministry that I'm just, I'm just running? You know, I know that I need to sit and wait on him because it's his Holy Spirit that'll do the work in me and through me. And it's going to be him that empowers me in, to be able to forgive people to nurture those relationships that I need to nurture. But I'm, but I'm scared. I'm afraid. I'm afraid to sit and waste, wait. I'm afraid of the very people that I'm hoping to reach, to minister to. I'm afraid of them. I'm afraid of personal involvement in their lives. I'm afraid that they might ask me something that I'm either not able or not willing to give. You know, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to fail. I'm afraid I'm going to fail them. I'm afraid I'm going to fail my family. I'm afraid of conversation because I'm afraid of people finding out that I don't have it all together because I'm afraid that they might find out that, you know, they think that I spend 16 hours a day in prayer and then the rest of the time studying the Bible, but I don't. I'm afraid that they might find out that, you know, I'm not near as holy as they, they have built me up to be, as I've built myself up to be. 
You know, I, I'm afraid of offending people with my words, my opinions. So I just keep my mouth shut. You know, I, I want to lead, but I'm afraid of going deeper. You can only take people as far as you've gone. I want, I want to give, but I'm afraid that I might not have enough to provide for my family, for their needs. I want a life of excitement, but I'm afraid to actually take the first step. I want to teach, but I don't really want to spend the time to study. You know? There's all of these things that, that, that build up inside of me, and, and I have to tell myself, you know, if, if it ain't God doing it, it ain't happening. Because I don't have that strength in and of myself. But I know that if I surrender myself completely to the Holy Spirit and allow Him to work in me and through me, that He'll give me everything that I need in order to make that happen. I want to give, I can just give. And he'll make sure that my needs are taken care of. And I know that if I really trust in him, that'll happen. I know that if I surrender everything to him, he'll give me the ability to mend those broken relationships that I have. I know that he will provide everything that I need. You know, a lot of times... I don't want to burn out, so I hold back. But if I'm working that hard that I think I might burn out, that's not the Holy Spirit doing the work. That's Kenneth doing the work. And I know that. But I'm afraid to surrender myself completely. Because there's all of these other unknowns. You know, what, what's God going to do with me if I actually say, okay, God, I'm yours, and I mean it. And then he says, well, I want you to go talk to that person. I want you to go move to this area. I want you to move halfway across the world. And I want you to minister to people who you don't know their language, you don't know their culture. It's completely foreign. And, you know, I'm afraid that something like that might happen. So I don't. So I hold back. But I know that in order for things to move forward with my relationships, I have to be surrendered to the Holy Spirit. And see, many times in our lives, we feel like we are the disciples in John chapter 21, lost. You know, we started our relationship. I don't know about y'all, but when I, I got saved, I was 22 years old. I got saved. I was living in my dad's basement in Colorado, and I was there, and I had gone, I had gone to church, and I had bought a Bible, and um, Gave my heart to the Lord. I came home every day. I would wake up. I'd turn on my light. Before I even got out of bed, I'd grab my Bible. And I'd roll over and I'd read my Bible. And I had my highlighter and I had a pen. And I would highlight stuff and I would underline stuff. And then when I would, when I would get done reading, I'd get up and I'd move over to my desk where I had a journal. And I'd sit there and I'd write out everything that the Lord was showing me that I learned. I would even just write down what happened that I read about. You know, if I was in the Old Testament and it didn't really make a whole lot of sense, I would just write down what it talked about that day but I did all of those things and I was like God you are awesome and you're right here with me and then something happened somewhere along the way and you know then I started getting up and then I'd take a shower and then I'd go eat breakfast and I'd do something else and I'd be walking out the house going oh didn't read my bible I'll do it later and then I'd walk out the door and then later turned into tomorrow and then tomorrow turned into next week and then all of a sudden, I'm in a place where I'm, I'm, I'm feeling just as abandoned as I was before, and I'm looking around going, God, what are you, what are you doing? What are, where are you? You used to be right here. You used to walk with me. You, you know, we would hold hands and skip down the halls and, and, and be, you know, happy and, and fun, and, and this was great, and, and now where are you? You know, couldn't have been me that walked away, but it was. 
but this is, where I, this is where a lot of times we find ourselves. We find ourselves in this place where, you know, our relationship with the Lord was so good for such a long time, and then all of a sudden something happened, and we pushed this off, and we pushed that off, and, and, we, and we forgot to do this, and, and we, you know, maybe we stopped serving at church, and that led to us not reading our Bible as much because we didn't have to be prepared. And then something else happened, and then we, we push it further and further and further away, and then, and then all of a sudden we're looking around, and we're going, God isn't even here with me anymore. He was. He was there. He, he showed himself to me. He showed himself to me a couple of times, but now he's gone. And we find ourselves in this place where, you know, we feel abandoned by God. Like we don't know the next step. But we're wrong. We do know the next step because he gave it to us. And all we have to do is we have to listen to and, and go back to all of those things that he had talked to us about many times before and, and everything else. And in the case of John and, and or Peter and, and all of these guys that were hanging out and wanting to go fishing, um, you know, all I had to do was think about it a little bit. And they were told what to do next, what the next step is. The next step is to make sure that your relationships are in check. You know, and when we, when we make sure that our relationships are in check, that includes our relationship with Jesus Christ, but it also includes all of the people that are around us. You know, God, Jesus came to reconcile us to him through his death on the cross, but he also came that we might reconcile others as well. We have this ministry, so we have to surrender ourselves to the Holy Spirit. He allows us, brings us into that place where we can minister to people where we can heal those relationships and then we can move forward and the thing that we need to understand is that as people you know as leaders of our homes men husbands fathers you know that change starts with us you know if we forgive our wives our children our co-workers everything else that changes our house that change in our house changes our church that change in our church changes our city that change in our city changes our country. You know, it doesn't start with people picketing here, there, and everywhere, calling for boycotts and everything else. You know what? Jesus said that the world is going to hate you because it hated me first. And if you're offended by everything that goes on around you, you're going to lead a miserable life. But if you can look at those things and understand that Jesus went through all of these things before we did, and we can look at it and we can brush it off and go, you know what? They're lost. And we can forgive them. That makes huge strides. And besides that, what was it that Jesus said would mark us as his? It was love. Remember in um, John chapter 13, verses 34 and 35, it says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. As I have loved you, that you also love one another. By this you'll know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. So the mark of a disciple of Jesus Christ is love. And as we, as we really take a look at this here, I want to be as practical as I can. But what's the first step in learning to love people? It would be forgiving people. Right? Because if I really love you, I'm not going to hold things against you not going to hold that against you. You know, that one thing that you did that one time? Not going to hold on to that. I'm going to forgive it, and I'm going to move forward. You know, there's so many things that, that we need to, to grab a hold of in the idea of forgiving people. We just, we just forgive. That's what we do. As we look at this, you know, starting here at verse 23, it says, Therefore the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And when he had begun to settle accounts, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. But as he was not able to pay, his master commanded that he be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and that payment be made. And the servant therefore fell down before him saying, Master, I have, have patience with me and I'll pay you all. Then the master of the servant was moved with compassion, released him and forgave him the debt. Forgave him the debt. I want to give you a definition, the definition of the word forgive. Forgive, according to Webster's Dictionary, forgive means to pardon or to remit as an offense or debt, to overlook an offense, 
and treat the offender as not guilty. The original and proper phrase is to forgive the offense, to send it away, to reject it, that is, not to impute it, or to put it to the offender. But by an easy transition, we also use the phrase to forgive the person offending. It's a forgiveness of a debt. It's, it's not holding somebody to a debt that you feel they owe you because of the hurt that you experienced, the offense that you experienced. The word or its derivatives of forgive, forgive, forgiven, forgave, forgiveness, all of those, anything that you can think of with forgive in it, all of those were used 114 times in the Bible, that word forgive. So do you think it's important? You know, and if Jesus came so that he would have a relationship with you, do you think your relationships are important? And do you think in order to make your relationships everything that they need to be, that forgiveness is then important in your relationships? It's huge. You know, if we look at this, we look at this story and we see the, the master and he wanted to settle accounts. It says that he began to, to settle accounts and one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. Now, just so that we put everything in perspective, I want to talk about how much a talent is. A talent is a, is a measurement, and as a, as a payment, a talent would be between 33 and 50 kilos of a particular thing, gold, silver, whatever. 33 and 50 kilos. Now, to give you perspective on that, 2.2 pounds is in a kilo. So, in 2005, the cost of gold was $20 per gram, and at that price, a talent conservatively speaking, say in 33 kilos, would have been $660,000. And this guy owed his master 10,000 of those. I don't even, I don't know if that's billion or trillion, but it's, it's a lot. Safe to say he couldn't pay it back, right? And as we look at this, we are that servant, you know? We are that guy, that girl that owes something that we could never even dream of paying back. And God decided to s decides to settle accounts, and he says, all right, so all of y'all that, that, that owe me all of this, yeah, you're, you're in prison, you're indentured servants, you're, you know, until all of this is paid off, and you think, you know, before you come to Jesus Christ, you, you think, okay, well, that's cool because I haven't done that much bad stuff, so I'll just do a bunch of good stuff, and that'll, you know, it'll cancel out all of that stuff, and, and I won't owe a debt anymore, and, you know, does it work that way? We owe a debt to God that cannot be paid. And then he said, yeah, you know what? I'll have compassion on you and I'll forgive you of that debt because we ask, because we come to him in a place of humility and say, Lord, you know, please forgive me of, of this thing because I, I know that I could never pay this back. And he says, okay. But then as we look further and it says, it says, but that servant went out and found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down at his feet and begged him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you all. And he would not, but went and threw him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what had been done, they were grieved and came and told their master all that had been done. Then his master, after he had called him, said to him, you wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant just as I had pity on you? And so as we think about these things, we have to think, you know, okay, God forgave me a debt that I could never pay. How much more then should I just be happy to forgive those that owe me something? or that I feel owe me something because of an offense, because of a word, because of a, 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 a perceived hurt at some point in time. You know, I, I, I struggle with this all the time because I, I have, you know, 
I, I hate to be one of those guys, but you know, I have, I have daddy issues. You know, my dad is, uh, my dad has caused tons. hurt in my life, in my kids' lives, but, you know, I have to look at him and, and go, you know, God forgave me all of these things, and the things that I have to put up with with him are, are really petty in the grand scheme of things, you know, and I have to say, you know, Dad, I forgive you, whether you ask for it or not. You know, see, one of the things that we have to grab a hold of is, is the fact that, you know, chances are that that apology that you've been waiting for, it ain't coming. You know, we, we don't want to forgive people because we expect an apology from them. But, you know, the more you expect that apology, the further away it's going to be. Over the last four years, it's something that, that's really been driven home to me, and, and it really hit home this past Thanksgiving. See, when we moved to Cusco, we moved down there so that we could take over this, this ministry that was happening to the tourists. You know, Cusco, I don't know, did I tell you? We get about two million tourists every year coming through Cusco because they're going to Machu Picchu. So we get all of these tourists coming through, and, and the original ministry that we had signed up for that we went down there to be a part of was a, a little cafe, a little coffee shop in, in the downtown area of Cusco, and it would cater to the tourists, and so we would have, you know, tourists come through all day long, and we'd give them coffee, and we'd tell them about Jesus, and they'd become Christian, and, you know, the whole world would change. You know, that was, that was the goal. And then... At the end of the day, at, on come Sunday, we would have a Bible study for all of those wonderful new converts because everybody that came through the door heard about Jesus and accepted Jesus, you know, and then we'd have Bible studies and we'd give them a little bit of doctrine and, and work them up a little bit and then they'd go back home to their, their countries all over the world and then they'd make disciples and then the whole world changes and then Jesus comes and everybody's happy. Sounds like a plan. Let's do it. So we go down there and we, and we start doing all of these things and, and, you know, this is the mindset that we have when we come and we're ready to conquer the world. And we do that for about a year and at the end of that year, the guy who actually, like, runs the coffee shop and everything came to me and he said, you know what, I, um, you need to go. You need to leave. <laughs> what? Me? Like, you need to go. I'm the one telling people about Jesus, you know. But he says, no, you know what you're doing? It's not effective. We're not reaching people. We're not doing things. I want you to leave. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't really want you hanging around here anymore. And I thought, man, he'll call me in two weeks. Tell me he can't do it, you know. I need your help. That call didn't happen. That conversation crushed me. You know, I went from... This, the, you know, the guy that had the, that ran the coffee, you know, did the coffee shop thing and had people coming in and, and had Bible studies and, and all of this and, and all of this was going on and, and it was stripped from me. Just like that. And I'm like, dude, that, that hurts. And I was mad. And I was mad for a good few years. And I would tell people, oh yeah, I've forgiven him. Oh, yeah, I, yeah, no big deal. And then I would see him, and I'd be mad all over again. And then I'd be bitter and angry and, and you know, cursing this guy and everything else, and all the time smiling, saying, yeah, I forgive him. You know, and, but I didn't. And I held on to that, and I, I, I held on to it for a couple of years, and, and finally, this last Thanksgiving, um, all of the, uh, a bunch of the m missionaries from the United States got together for Thanksgiving. And Letty and, and the kids and I went, and, uh, and this guy was there with his family. And at some point in the night, I grabbed a hold of him, and I was like, dude, you have to talk to me. And he says, okay, you know, and we sat down, and I told him, I said, you know, 
I've held on to a lot of anger and a lot of hurt for the last two years. And I don't know if you understand that you did that to me, but I'm, I'm sorry for being so angry with you. And I'm, I'm sorry for holding on to it for so long. And I want you to know that, you know, what I thought was the worst thing in the world, I forgive you for it. And he looked at me and he was like, well, you know, I'm glad you told me. I'm glad you talked to me finally because over the last couple of years, I've wanted to call. I've wanted to call, but when I looked at you, everything seemed to be going fine and everything was moving along. And so I thought, eh, he probably doesn't even think about it anymore. He said, but you know, Kenneth, things didn't, things didn't work out the way that I, that I thought they were going to. And even that conversation didn't come out the way that I had planned. And I'm really sorry that I, that you had to deal with that. And I understand, you know, that you were hurt. And I just thought, this is, this is incredible. This guy, I've been waiting for an apology for this guy, from this guy for years. But it wasn't coming. You know, I had to actually take the lead of the Holy Spirit to sit down and have the conversation with him to find out that he was feeling the same way about the same situation, but neither one of us were smart enough to have that conversation three years ago when we could have been both moving forward and, and, and happy, you know? And the sad thing is, is this happens all the time within our homes. You know, we hurt each other. We say things that we don't mean. We don't even realize that we hurt people when we do it, but so we don't apologize. And the person's waiting for an apology, but we don't know what's going on. So we don't, we don't apologize. And then it's weird between <laughs> us, you know? And, we, and we, have to, we have to work through all of that. You know, the thing is, is Ephesians chapter 4, verses 30 through 32 tell us, and did not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. And how did God forgive you? Through Christ Jesus. It was complete. Right? It was completely he didn't say, I'm going to forgive everything but that one thing that you did that one time. But that's how we do it a lot, don't we? We go, yeah, I, you know, I forgive it when, I forgive you when you called me that name, but you know that one time that you kicked me in the shin when we were on the playground, you know, and we were six? I'm holding on to that because I ain't letting it happen again. <laughs> but we don't, we don't forgive. We don't really clear it out. But God calls us to forgive just as God in Christ Jesus forgave us. You know, God through Christ Jesus didn't forgive us as we forgive other people. Thank God. Because <laughs> I wouldn't be forgiven for anything. You know? But it's that relationship that is so important because we have to, we have to nurture those things. You know, and it, and it has to start in our homes. You know, it has to start there because we don't, we don't affect things like we think we do when our houses are falling apart. You know, I, I, can, I can go out and I can work and I can teach Bible studies and I can minister to people and I can pray for people and I can do all of those things. But if my family is falling apart, really I'm not, I'm not doing anything, you know? I have, to, I have to make sure that my family, that those relationships there first are correct after I know that my relationship with God is correct. You know, so this morning, if, well, before I get to, get to that, I just, you know, so what I did because I thought, you know, I'm not going to be the guy that comes up here and tells you that you should do all of this stuff and then not do it myself. 
Um, Because remember that whole being real thing? I wanted to do that. So what did I do? I sat down and I wrote a list of names. List of names of those people that I've been holding something against for however long it may be. Maybe it was just yesterday. Maybe it was six years ago. Maybe it was 20 years ago. But I wrote down those names, and then right next to those names, I wrote their offenses. And then as I did that, I got to look at it and see how petty all of those things were. And I decided, you know, it'd probably be a good idea if I get in touch with these people. And I have that conversation. And it's not fun (laughs) because you have to admit that you were wrong at some point. You know, I was wrong for holding on to this or I was wrong for doing that thing. And I need you to forgive me just as much as I need to forgive you. And so I did that. And you would not believe the peace that you have when you just let all of those things go. You know, I, I know that we have, we have our different issues with different things and different people, and, and I know that they're not all the same, and I know that, you know, some of us are going to deal with those in different ways, but I would encourage you to, ta- to make a list. Make a list of the, the names of the people that have wronged you, and then right next to it, write what, how they wronged you, <laughs> and then pray about how can I make this right? Do I need to call them? Do I need to write them a letter? Do I need to give it to God because they're not alive anymore? Do, you know, what do I need to do in order to make this right? But I would encourage you that you start today making those things right because when we, once we, once we come to that place, like that's, that's the first thing that we should be doing as believers is loving people enough to forgive them, you know, and forgive them of everything that they've, that we think they've done wrong, whether we're right or not, you know? It's what God did in in Christ Jesus for for us. And now we have that opportunity to do that again for him by the power of his Holy Spirit. And so this morning, I would would just ask that that you, you know, really kind of look at yourself and your life and, and where you are and you know, if maybe you're in one of those places where you've somehow gotten a distance between you and God. Maybe you've never closed that gap to begin with. I don't know. But I would ask that you examine that and look at that and say, first of all, do, is my relationship with God right or is there something keeping me from him? And if it is right, then you can ask him, how can I fix those relationships that I need to fix? in order that you might bless my life in a way that I can actually do what you've asked me to do. It's not easy, and it's not fun. But the results, the end rewards, are fantastic. You know, I I can't stress enough how important those relationships are because God wants that. And as we reconcile those relationships, we're reconciled to God. We reconcile those relationships. Things change. We exercise that faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Our faith grows stronger. Our walk grows stronger. Our, our time that we spend with Jesus Christ, who, who maybe at this point in time is 100 miles away, comes real close. <laughs> you know? Bible tells us to, to draw near to him and he'll draw near to us. But we got to draw near to him through his ministry. Through seeing what he wants us to do. And he wants us to fix those things. And we should do that as soon as possible. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for today. I thank you that um, that you're here, God, that you, (coughs) that you're working in each and every one of us, God, and, and, uh, Lord, I don't know if there's people here that, that don't know you, or that, that feel like you're a million miles away from them, 
today, but I pray that even right now, if there are, that you would reach out and that you would grab hold and that you would pull them close, that you would bring them into your family, even right now, God, that you would forgive them of their sins as you've forgiven so many of us before. And God, that you would help us to reconcile the relationships that that have fallen apart in our own lives through hurts that maybe we received, maybe we gave out, Lord. Help us to recognize where we need to apologize and where we need to forgive. And give us the strength to do that, Lord. We pray that your Holy Spirit would just fall afresh on us right now, God, and that you would empower us to do those things. God, be with us. Walk with us. In Jesus' name, amen. That was awesome. And the ushers are going to come forward right now so you can worship the Lord in your tithe and offerings. We're going to do a couple more songs here. us in that while we were yet sinners you died on that cross for us Jesus oh Lord thank you for your mercies that are made new and available every single day 
And God, just please put it on our hearts this week to make right uh, those things that we need to get right with people, with you, Lord. And uh, may you just be blessed. Lord, I pray that we would just have a conviction to share your love and your truth with others this week. And uh, be, be glorified in our lives, Lord. We love you, Lord. And we lift this up to you in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. God bless you all. Uh, if you have children in um, the ministry, you may go and save your children from the teachers. Just kidding. We're going to do one more song if you want to stay and worship with us. We would love that.
Lord, you are perfect. And God, again, just be with us this week. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. God bless you all. Have a great week in the Lord. If you still need prayer, please don't, don't leave without being prayed for. Yeah.